Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 659. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is April 27th, 2021. All right, we're, we're crunching shows together here. We had a, a special show on Saturday. Now we're doing a show on Tuesday. So there has not been a lot of news between these uh, uh, two recordings. So you're not going to get a, a whole 44-minute, 45 45-minute Anglican Unscripted unless we just start to babble on. I feel like I'm babbling on already. Before we get too far into the show, please like, share, comment. And if you want to, you can subscribe to the show. I recommend that. And... We have a podcast, which is the duplicate of this, in audio. You can find that in the show notes on YouTube. Uh, where are you, Kevin? Well, we're just outside of King of Prussia uh, in a state park called French Creek State Park in Pennsylvania. We got Douglasville, to... Pen Douglasville Doug Pennsylvania. Douglasville, Pennsylvania. You used to go to high school around here, right? I went to high school to the Hill School in Pottstown, Pennsylvania, which is just the next town east. Yep. Well, I know. 422. I know why they call it Hill <laughs> School. <laughs> it's all hills here. Um, I was in Florida for the longest time, and as you know, Florida is a very flat uh, state. Uh, you can find some hills out uh, on the uh, the west coast. Where there. I am. Yeah, where I you are. <laughs> But so here everything's up and down just the way I like it so it's it's kind of cool let's uh before we get too far how, how's your week going very busy um we're uh, as I mentioned last week we're attendance wise where I was when I started seven eight years ago at the parish and so we're going back to where we were seven or eight years ago with reaching out to people calling people urging people to bring their friends and neighbors and it's uh it's exciting uh, because it's always exciting when you're starting a project but at the same time it's a lot of work a lot of work and we still have uh over 100 plus staying away on the week sundays because of fears from covid sure so it's it's uh, but at the same time, we're starting to get walk-in traffic again, where we have people show up who we haven't really sort of reached out to, who then stay after and talk to me or talk to one of the other clergy. And what I'm finding is that this year of lockdown has left some people with a deep spiritual need and longing that they didn't know they had. So we had this past Sunday after the service, a lady came, young woman in her 30s, and she came and after the service, uh, she wanted to talk to me and we talked for a good hour um, about her life, about her hopes and dreams and aspirations and where was God in all this and was God truly calling her? You know, here was somebody who was a normal American in the sense that they were Christian, in the sense that they weren't Jewish because most Americans identify as being Christian unless there's some sort of default ethnic background. Mm -hmm. And so she was a Christian where she had probably been baptized and probably that was it. And no real Sunday outreach as a child or upbringing. But the God bug was somehow biting her. And this COVID brought her to a place where she, it, there's got to be more than life than what's here. I, I think COVID is a, a wake up call to, you know, our Western culture, at least, where we were so busy doing our 40 to 60 hours at work, getting kids to all their uh, activities after school, going to bed, getting up and doing it all over again. And we, we've had the shakeup of that, how, how the West works now. And people are mm -hmm. now more aware of family. Uh, I've mm -hmm. called my mom more in the last year than I did in the previous you know, 30 years. You know, I'm calling she, you again. Yes, mom. Just want to check up on you. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm still here. Okay. How's dad? Dad's fine. Stop calling every day. <laughs> yes, mom. And so we have this new, new awareness of family and the importance of time and the importance of time. Um, and it's not just this uh, eat out all the time mentality, this Uber all the time mentality, this convenience all the time. But what is important to us? And mm -hmm. uh, 
I think this is a great opportunity to, for the church to say, hey, glad you, this pandemic got your attention. Let us explain what's important uh, uh, to you, uh, to God, and your relationship together. So we'll see how this works. Uh, but you are, many churches, including yours, starting back at square one. You know, yeah, the attendance is what it was five years ago, six years ago, seven years ago. Well, and actually, for the Episcopal Church, that would have meant we'd have been, uh, what, we've lost 30, 30% in the last yes, 10 30%. years? 30%. Oh, my gosh. Nash nationally, not us, but nationally. No, yeah, and oh. a lot of churches, even Orthodox churches, conservative churches, ACNA churches have lost uh, some membership over this uh, COVID. And, you know, what you've lost is people who had this as their pattern. If your pattern was to go to Bible study or to go to uh, one or two events at the church during the week and then go to Sunday service, um, then go out to lunch, that pattern is gone. It was shaken up like we talked about before. How do you reestablish that church pattern, that worship pattern uh, in gathering together again when we still have that fear? Because we're getting mixed, we're getting mixed signals from the CDC. The CDC says, well, you know, I know you got the double shot but you'll probably still have to wear a mask or two masks, at least until Christmas when you can get a booster shot. And they may be able to do booster shots every year. And you, you, when you travel on planes and stuff, you'll still want to wear a mask. If you, if you ever find yourself in close contact with other people, you'll want to wear a mask. But other than that, this vaccine is perfect. And so you're getting this mixed message. Well, when can I go to church? When can I sing? When can I praise? When can I uh, you, you know, gather with my brothers and sisters in Christ? Well, don't listen to the CDC if you ever want to uh, find out that answer. Um, I think you know the, the time has come, if you've been double vaccinated, uh, to, to get to your church. There's a commentator, uh, the cartoonist Scott Adams. He's mm -hmm. the author of the Dilbert column, and he's become a very, uh, very popular and controversial uh, political commentator. He was one of the only people to pick Trump not because he's hyper conservative, but because he looked at the tools and assets Donald Trump brought and said that that guy's going to go places. Well, Scott Adams has a phrase that he used to describe Donald Trump's genius, which is that Trump shakes the box, that if he doesn't like the way the pieces are laid out, he'll pick the box, shake it all over again, and we'll see what arises. And COVID, as you say, has shaken the box. One of the things I've found which is extraordinary to me is we do services seven days a week online uh, morning and evening prayer plus a whole slew on Sunday mornings and you know the normal Episcopal Church doesn't do morning and evening prayer they just don't and maybe some uh, cathedrals or some very mega churches they may do that but part most people don't well our Sunday online attendance is okay. It's, but you know, we don't have a beautiful building. We're not the cathedral in Washington. We don't have the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. I may think I'm a hotshot preacher, but there are much better ones out there. So the Sunday package we offer appeals essentially to those who are already predisposed to watch us. But morning and evening prayer, we are get, we're getting bigger audiences than Sunday morning because we're the only ones that seem to be offering that in seven to 10 minute little bites. And there's no sermon, there's just the readings and the Bible. And Kevin's and my uh, radio announcer voices. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess here, here's the thing, it, you know, <clears throat> daily offices for people at home online are, that's just a developing market. Um, that I didn't, I'd never thought in my time would ever be popular. It was just a bit of the prayer book that was there, the priest did. Um, but that's well, an example of the difference between then and now in COVID times. I think that's something that Facebook has allowed us to do uh, with Facebook Live and Facebook Video um, and YouTube as well, is to uh, promote these services that people have never heard of before. There are mm -hmm. cradle Episcopalians and cradle Anglicans and cradle Roman Catholics that didn't know about the daily office well there's yeah. there's a little story out of england and if i could sort of segue and sure. i'm 
I'm, I'm surprising Kevin because we didn't oh. talk about this. Some group, somebody did a stir- survey uh, of the British people. Would you go to a robot priest for pastoral care? And I was thinking, well, most Church of England priests are a bit of a robot, so they're <laughs> dead inside. So you're, you're not talking THX 1138, uh, the, the sci-fi movie. You're talking the real Church of England. <laughs> but he, here, here's, we're in a world where people see, and I don't think it was a joke, because it was being reported in some of the British religious news that people, a good portion, it's like 40%, correct me if I'm wrong in the comments, but it was like 40 plus percent who would be perfectly happy going to a robot non-human priest. Now, apart from the jokes about non-human priests, what is that telling us about the power of faith and religion? Is it telling us this is counterfeit or that there's such a deep longing that people will even put up with crappy uh, priests? That's that's the world we're living in. That these questions are being uh, uh, tossed about. Well, I mean, the desire is there. The need's not being met. Mm-hmm. You know, we as humans uh, are created, and we have the sense of need to know our Creator. And the Church, the Church of England, uh, the Roman Catholic Church, uh, many de- most denominations around the world are not meeting that need to help you understand who your creator is. And Mm -hmm. the church instead has become, I hate to say this, woke. And I'm gonna I'm gonna (laughs) I'm gonna segue now too, because I I want to rename our Archbishop Justin Welby to Archbishop Justin Wokely. Uh, or woke be, <laughs> because we have a story this week of kind of the the ultimate wokeness that just uh, backfired. Um, he, he thought there's a way that I can reach out to me being the white archbishop to other uh, non-white archbishops and show them how woke I am, and I will virtual signal with the cross, and you will lo- <laughs> you will find unity and love and peace and happiness. George, can you tell us this wonderful woke story by Justin Wokeley? Well, the right honorable and most woke Justin Wokeley. A little bit of a background. In Britain, there is a move among certain groups of people to return artifacts that were collected over Britain's colonial empire. So, um, and from further abroad. So that, for instance, there are the Elgin marbles in the... uh, uh, British Museum, which were taken from the Acropolis in Athens in the n- early 19th century. There are artifacts from the Imperial Palace in China that were taken from the sack of Peking. And one of these uh, cultural native artifacts are the Benin bronzes. In the 19- late 19th century, Benin, which was a kingdom in what is now Nigeria, was a bloodthirsty, nasty, slaving kingdom uh, who was very fierce and violent. And the British uh, went to war with them after the Benin uh, attacked and killed some missionaries and uh, people under the protection of the British. Well, they were defeated, and the Benin had an art culture where they would cast these bronze figurines, and you may see them in in uh, on stamps or in art books about the Benin bronzes, and they were carried off to England as spoils of war, which has happened since the beginning of time. Uh, Napoleon took the obelisk Cleopatra's needle back to Paris. And well, I think so what some so people forth. forget is our first uh, many centuries as civilizations were built on conquest. Okay, mm. one country, tribe, nation would conquest over another. And in that were the spoils. These are the spoils of those wars. I'm not trying to put this into 21st century context of what was right and wrong. This is just how it was. So here we have this movement by woke academics and woke people decrying Britain, British imperial history as being bad thing. So Justin Welby jumps on the bandwagon. His predecessor, Robert Runcie, I believe in 1984, was given to Benin bronzes on a trip to Nigeria. 
Okay, and hold on. So these were not taken in conquest. No. These were they were, they were given to Lambeth Palace to put on the book on the mantelpiece. Just like you have, just like at your grandmother's house, you have knickknacks from her world travels, uh, little Buddha statue, uh, pagoda, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, Robert Runcy was given some Benin bronzes. Well, Justin Welby announced that he was going to return these to Nigeria as a token of British and his apology for the destructive behavior of his colonial and imperial ancestors. Now, this did not get a lot of play in the British press, partially because nobody cares anymore about what Justin Welby says. So it was picked up in some of the religious press. And in fact, we didn't even pick it up at Anglican Inc. because it was just such a, a silly story. A not silly non story. Yeah. But now we're taking, now we're going to run after it. Well, it turned out after the Nigerians were sort of notified that these were coming back, it was pointed out to Justin Welby, well, thank you very much, but these were reproductions made in the 1980s. Uh, these are tour, you know, and if you turn it over made it and giant. look at the bottom. <laughs> so Justin Welby, out of a spirit of virtue signaling, has managed to insult his Niger the Nigerians yet again Matt, you know, by a not looking at the damn things before he says he's going to send them back. You know, if he thinks they're ugly, just stick them in the closet in the third floor, and you know, wait till grandma comes before you put them out. But instead, he needs to insult the Nigerians. He needs to show how utterly gauche he is by not, you know, by thinking these were rare antiquities and that they're fakes. But not even they were not even made to be fakes. They were just reproductions, like you get you, like you get in any very expensive tourist shop when you visit a foreign country. <sighs> Returning and, gifts. I know. Listen, if it were taken in conquest and you felt guilty and you wanted to do as the archbishop, that's fine. But be more informed. Um, but just but Justin Welby truly is the gift that gives on giving. He's becoming our new Catherine Jeffrey Shorey. Just. Whatever he does has that magical touch about it that just makes the news for us. It, uh, well, he's not as spiritually violent as Catherine Jeffrey Shorey was, but um, certainly is imbecilic in some ways. Uh, but the whole Church of England itself has become very woke. Um, they have realized that their European ancestry and their uh, British ancestry, that they're white and they're ashamed of it, George. And... Uh, now we hear all through their synods and all through the churches, all their tweets on uh, Twitter from the, the the bishops that, woe is I, for I am white, and I am sh ashamed, and I am privileged. And we're just going to hear about this now until the next uh, uh, in vogue thing happens. And it, it's getting really tiring really quick. We, our last broadcast was just after the first day of General Synod where uh, the Archbishop of York bemoaned the fact that we're very few ethnic minorities in senior positions in the Church of England and that we need to do something about it, says the man who replaced the only black Archbishop. Uh, not thinking, in other words, it's not his, it's his job to complain about it, but it's not his job to do anything personally about it. Mm -hmm. Well the synod went down the path uh, given to it of bemoaning uh, the evils of uh, being white and what is so telling is that the bishops all put out not all but the vast majority of bishops put out their statements affirming the church of england's race commission and rubbishing the government's race commission we spoke about the two last year the church of england's uh, last week the church of england's race commission basically adopts wholeheartedly the critical race theory approach, that there's inherent evil in whiteness, that uh, white males in particular have a uh, privilege that uh, must be rectified, and that the uh, Well, no, no, Jesus it, it can't be rectified, and it's not forgivable. Well, that's true. Okay. That you, but the, the lunacy, the madness, Mm -hmm. of the critical race theory of the uh, 
some of the kookiness of if you study if you were in seminary as i was uh 30 years ago you, you were you saw some of the fruits of the black theology movement uh mm -hmm. these uh these things that were came out of the uh civil rights movement and the uh liberation struggles in africa and on one level some of them were really really fun wonderful people and that would be that martin luther king jr level mm -hmm. and if you remember the clips from his speech at the washington uh, memorial uh the what in washington you know that he dreamt of a day when people would be judged on the quality of their character not the color of their skin well that second generation moved on uh to judging you not by the color of your character but the, the quality of your, your quality character, of your character, character but by the color of your skin yeah so we now have the second and third generations which are the anti martin luther king jr and now where we if you look at some of the things coming out in black theology in woke theology in womanist theology if you substitute the word black a white for black mm -hmm. you have almost a word for word uh worldview that a hundred years ago the most unreconstructed racist southerner would be spouting that we would all be laughing at if kkk had a twitter feed all you would have to do is replace the colors i mean that's mm -hmm. um that's how bad critical race theory is and how bad uh, you know, we see it in the press, we see it in our churches, and we see it in our universities right now. People are are judging you by the color of your skin once again. Mm -hmm. And, and um, it, it's so hard to see that a church is so blinded by this. If you, at, at any point, use the words white privilege, well, that those are the definition, those are the words taught by critical race theory. It, it's That's the where it came from. There's a, a phrase in England that may be foreign to our American viewers, which is called the man in the white van. I may have mangled it a bit. A little bit. But it's uh, the uh, sort of the tradesman, the independent tradesman, the uh, professional glazer, the plumber, the, the work, success, working class men. They are the enemy. Um, they are the new kulaks, to use a Russian example from the Stalinist era successful working class people who have prospered by the sweat and labor of their own hands not because they were born into privilege not because they were educated Eton and oxford and went to the urn camps but people who thrive their own skills and ability have become successful machinists tradesmen plumbers they are the enemy in britain and the church of england has singled them out as being the enemy part of the hatred for george carey in recent years is that George Carey came from this class and the class struck we Britain likes to think that it these people the leadership of the Church of England think that we're a racist society but we're also a classless society we've overcome the class distinctions of the past and that's so untrue that the class distinctions and divisions now are just getting worse and worse and worse and it is being coached, uh, it is being disguised <clears throat> by um, denigrating white working class. The unforgivable, and yeah. yeah. The yeah. In the United States, they're called the deplorables yeah. by Hillary Clinton. Mm -hmm. how, how could the Church of England call itself a national church, a church for all people, if it is denigrating the majority of the country well uh, hold on i do have a solution for the church of england george and kind of script david if anything we're about solutions here the largest growing population in britain in the uk in england is muslim i think it's time to fill the church of england with leaders from the islamic community from the muslim community um, if you really want to open up and, and show that you are an open church and that you are truly a woke church, it's time to really open your doors to a different style of leadership. It's time. Kevin, I hate to say this, but it's already happened. What? It's been happening. Do you remember? Well, Kevin, let's, let's, 
Kelvin Holdsworthy was the de- is the dean of the Episcopal Cathedral in Glasgow, mm. and he invited Muslims to come re- preach at a certain service and read mm. the Muslim prayers. And part of the Muslim prayers is the are the calls to faith, and part of that faith specifically denigrates Christianity as being a false religion. Yeah. And there's this English retired priest who happened to be a chaplain to the Queen named Gavin Ashenden, who said, no, this isn't on, not on, and he complained about it. And he was asked to step down politely as a chaplain to the Queen so as not to make noise. He wasn't asked by the Queen, of course. He was asked by the bureaucrats at Buckingham Palace who want to make sure everything is nice and bland. But this is happening. There was a church in uh, Waterloo in on the... Uh, in, in London that, uh, remember, we had a big story about how the priest allowed the local Muslim community to use it, and therefore, before the service, they took down all the crosses and draped all the pictures of uh, Jesus, Jesus and Mary. Yeah. So this is, and, you know, both of these are, both of the, here's the funny thing, both the Waterloo Church and the Glasgow Church are led by gay men who are out, who are, aggressively, politically so. And they are cultivating the friendships with the Islamist lobby. Now, in Islamist nations, those guys would be murdered. We saw this in ISIS, that they, you know, gays are thrown off the tops of buildings and stones to death. So in the short-term political alliance, the left in Britain is forming a coalition with the Islamists and if they win, the fight then turns between the left and the Islamists, and the Islamists are ready to kill, as they have shown around the world. It's, what are these guys thinking? <clears throat> Once again, there is a need, a desire, for people after COVID to know their creator. The Church of England is not meeting that need, and they are willing to go and be served by robots in order to meet that need. Uh, George, it, it is crazy. Let's move on here to some more show notes I have. Um, one of the things that uh, Anglican Scripted is known for uh, is asking for accountability in the church. When things go awry, you stop, you repent, you return to the faith, and you move forward. And we see that from time to time, and we like to, uh, when we see it, make it known, make it public. We reported a story uh, of Archbishop Stanley Antigali from Uganda had an affair. We got in a lot of trouble for reporting it at the time, and uh, many people and journalists from Uganda were extremely mad at us. But we report it because in hopes that the church will call for this to repentance that there will be made light and that Christ would be glorified at the end of this. There's redemption, there's forgiveness. Here we see in a story that George is going to tell us that that's how it worked. By making the story public, the church said, okay, we will deal with this and we will deal with it publicly. We're not going to hide it. The Church of Uganda is celebrating its 60th anniversary as an independent province. And on Thursday, they began the celebrations with a, with a service at St. Paul's Cathedral in Namrimbe, which is a suburb of Kampala. And the bishops were all there, and the members of the press were invited. Kevin and I got a uh, press, uh, did we want to come for the show? Uh, uh, a little too short notice, but thanks for the invite anyway. Um, and at this service, which was basically closed to the general public because of COVID, you had to get a ticket. But the press was there. Stanley and Tagali was brought forward. And, at, and Stanley and Tagali then spoke to the bishops there, asking their pardon for his sin. He confessed his sins. The husband of his paramour was there, who was a priest of the Church of Uganda. He asked his pardon and the pardon of their families. Um, he confessed his sins, he repented, and after his, this didn't take long, it wasn't a Bill Clinton type repentance. Uh, the bishops then surrounded him and uh, Archbishop, uh, the current Archbishop, um, 
whose name just uh, Archbishop Stephen Kazimba yep. laid, laid laid hands on him and prayed for him and offered his forgiveness. So what does this mean? Well, on one level, the Ugandans did this. Archbishop Kazimba, from start to finish, did this perfectly. He didn't hide anything. Uh, he told us foreigners, and Kevin and I are as foreign as you can get. Um, he told us foreigners about this when we asked, when we said we'd heard these rumors, and he told us the truth. Mm -hmm. And we reported that we reported this, and but. They didn't hide it. The archbishop was given an opportunity to repent and confess mm -hmm. and not just give these sort of fake, oh, I apologize for the crimes of my ancestors a hundred years ago, but I, I sinned and I know I sinned and I've fallen short and I ask your forgiveness and I ask God's forgiveness and I ask the forgiveness of those I've hurt. And then he was received back into the fold. Now, He's not going to be returning to the high profile ministry he once had, but he is back in the fellowship of Christian believers, having been absolved of his sins. And in this, Christ is glorified. Mm -hmm. This is it. This is this is the reason we do what we do. Uh, this is this is Kevin. a shining moment for the church. Mm -hmm. A shining moment. Kevin, Kevin, you contrasted this in our pre-show with the woke movement. Hmm. I mean, how many people are forgiven for for their crimes? Uh, of being white. In the, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, that's the thing with critical race theory. Being white is evil and unforgivable because you are racism and you can't overcome that sin of racism. And because of that, you cannot be forgiven. And um, that's 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 critical race theory 101 you know george i was just thinking about this the other day why on earth as a reporter in in the anglican church do i have to be an expert on critical race theory because it's a cancer this is a cancer taking over the church and well critical race theory as i as i mentioned you know, it's compared to the most evil of the uh, racist demagoguery of a century ago mm -hmm. but just Within the Nazi movement, uh, a Jew could not be un cannot not un be a Jew. Right. Um, Edith Stein was a Catholic nun who had been born and reared as a Jew and converted to Christianity, became a Catholic nun, and she and all the other converts to Christianity from Judaism were killed by the Nazis if they could get lay their hands on them because there was no forgiveness for that evil sin that you were born a Jew. There's no forgiveness in this. It's the same thinking that we see in these race uh, baiters and race mongers uh, who uh, pass themselves off as Christian theologians. That they're, they're just the, our generation's Nazis. No, I, I think Justin Wolkby wants to be forgiven. So that's what he's working for. Um, but see, the thing is, he's such, Justin, he, he doesn't attempt to justify any of his actions by reaching out to theology or philosophy. In other words, these woke Nazis, uh, at least they have an ideology that they're spouting. For Justin Welby, it's a weather vane. He could just as easily be on the green bandwagon or the sex bandwagon or the labor bandwagon. You know, whatever's the latest cause, he'd be there. Yeah. Um, divorce can be ugly. I'm going to tell you that right now. Um, expensive. It makes for great books. Wonderful TV shows. If you ever watched the movie uh, uh, War of the Roses with Michael uh, Douglas and Kathleen Turner, that was a wonderful movie about a divorce. And sometimes we get to see it when it happens in legal terms like in the church in Fort Worth. Uh, we reported last week that, uh, you know, clearly the Supreme Court of Texas has decided the case uh, for the ACNA, the pro-ACNA Episcopal Diocese of Fort Worth. It was refuted. The, the United States Supreme Court did not want to overturn it. And so that's the law of the land, neutral principles. 
they get to keep the property. However, <laughs> now comes the, the, the little things that are happening in Fort Worth when it's time for the Episcopal Church, the 815 Episcopal Church, to start to exit their churches. This is where divorce becomes uh, ugly. And I don't like to see this. I, I don't like to see this, whether it's from an ACNA congregation or from a Fort Worth congregation. But uh, they're starting to steal the candles, George. Yeah, um, we reported last week about the uh, the uh, situation in Fort Worth. There are five properties that are being given back to the ACNA-affiliated diocese that have been held for the last 12 years by the Episcopal-affiliated group. And essentially, the, the courts ruled, Texas Supreme Court ruled, that everything that was there, it, when did this happen, 2009? Mm -hmm. Um, goes to the ACN affiliated diocese, and that's that's how it's happened with uh, in the cases like in Virginia and other places where the Episcopal Church has triumphed over the ACN breakaways. Right. And so, all assets that existed before the lawsuit get transferred over to the, the victor. New Jeez. things that have been purchased. Yeah. The new things. So. So we have this story, and I haven't yet put this down on Anglican Inc. because I was trying to find an angle to, to take this forward. Um, now we have an angle. Uh, Suzanne Gill, the uh, press spokesman for the uh, ACNA affiliated Diocese of Fort Worth, shared some concerns the diocese is having. She had a picture from uh, the, the Bishop Ryan Reed put out an ad clarum letter to his diocese. And there was a picture of the church in Wichita Falls on March 21st. You see all the the, uh, the pews, the hymnals, the prayer books, the processional crosses, the altar, the candles, all the stuff that an Episcopal church has when it's all set up for Sunday. And then there was a picture taken this week, and it's an empty room. The Episcopal faction, the 815 faction, in moving out, essentially, I don't know if they took the bathroom faucets, but it was that level of uh, bad divorce, of just leaving an empty shell of a building. Uh, well, and I, I don't think the Vichita Falls Church bought those pews, bought those 1979 prayer books, bought the the altar furnishings. Well, now I'm going to contrast to this to many years ago when Christ Church Parish of uh, Watertown, Connecticut left the Episcopal Church. We negotiated with the bishop to keep a few items. We wanted to keep the processional cross. We wanted to keep the, the altar Bible. We wanted to keep a couple things. And we wanted some prayer books so we didn't have to go and, and uh, get some more prayer books. And we would be meeting in a hotel in, in Waterbury for a couple months. And he agreed to all that. It was a, a nice, you know, yeah, you can have that. Yeah, whatever. He knew right away that he was never going to be able to refill that church. It was going to be a property for sale, and whatever we wanted, you know, he pretty much agreed to, um, and so we took. Didn't they? Uh, didn't they sell it to a private school or something? Yeah, they sold or? it to, to Taft, which is a private school. So we took a carload of stuff out that the bishop agreed we could have. You know, and we didn't take a truckload, a a semi truck full of stuff out. We didn't throw the pews in the back of a, a Acme moving van. So you know, times are changing. Uh, let's do a quick story here. Um, John Bruno, Bishop uh, of Los Angeles, has passed from this world. Uh, and he was, certainly was a, uh, I'm going to put it mildly, a character within the Episcopal Church. Uh, I've always said he was the bishop the Episcopal Church deserved, um, but uh, he has passed on, George. Yes, John Bruno was the bishop uh, with the St. James Newport Beach uh, ongoing awesome. saga. Yeah. The first battle uh, between the co congregation itself, which wanted to split, and eventually through the shenanigans of the California courts was forced out. And then the second Episcopal congregation that was refounded. And among one of the few one of the few bright spots in the Episcopal Church's growth and witness mm -hmm. had been the refounded St. James, they now call it St. James the Great Newport Beach. And 
most as he said most of these time most of the times these these uh, churches that have to be that are kept but the people have left are like your church in waterbury they they're sold off or there's something mm -hmm. or other well the a woman priest was brought in to be priest in charge and she turned it around and she filled the building but john bruno wanted to sell off the property anyway and he, mm -hmm. and he was just as he was accused and found to be of just as sneaky just as underhanded as he was when he's dealing with the Acna group. So it wasn't that John Bruno had anything against Acna. Uh, I think it must have been St. James, Newport Beach. He wanted the money from selling this waterside property in a Orange County. And he was an equally bad bishop, dis despite your theology. <laughs> you know. and, he, and he was found to have, uh, he was, and in an unusual step, the Episcopal Church disciplined him and suspended him, uh, and so he retired uh, from the ministry because he basically, you know, basically found that he had abused his office. And well, he has passed away at the age of seventy-two or seventy-four. Yeah, I'm not that. sure. But we're post his death almost a couple of days now. No story on ENS. No Episcopal News Service coverage of this at all. Um, just saying. We put out the Diocese of Los Angeles statement, which mm -hmm. you know, is when you remember when when evil Aunt Carol dies, you still are nice about it and don't mention all the bad times. Remember the good times. Yeah, remember, good time. she wants. Uh, what did she once do that was not? Uh, well, she once turned on the lights when she came into a room or something. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the selfless act. Yeah. So. I don't want to talk too much more about that without going uh, too negative. But um, the passing of John Bruno. George, I think that's our full show for today. We actually did cover 42 minutes. That's just our pattern. We will talk two subjects to death for 44 minutes. The way we are. Well, let me just, for those who are going to comment, my uh, iPads died. Uh, I, uh, I, 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 uh, these thingies. The, the little things you stick in your ears, um, whatever. It died just as our show began, and That's if right. we if I use the speaker from the computer, we get an echo, and so I I look like an air traffic controller. Okay, listen, you know, to be totally woke, I'm going to join you in your in your suffering. I'm Kevin Coulson, and I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode six hundred fifty nine of Anglican Unscripted. <laughs>